Thank you all so much for being here. This is a beautiful community of people that I'm standing in front of. We start. So the strategy for this evening is that um, each of us will share some slides and talk for about 10 minutes, hopefully. And then you'll have, and then we'll just open up the space for conversation uh, among all of us, okay? So that's the strategy. I hope it works. Um, hold on just a second. Mm. Here are my notes. Um, okay, so it's my job to introduce the, uh, the Russia study tour. Um, oops, give me a minute. I want to offer a caveat. Here you see a photo of um, some gentlemen representing the Russian Veterans for Peace community, plus some of our, uh, I guess it's Americans, who are also representing Veterans for Peace. Um, so my caveat is this. If you believe that Russia is our enemy, this could be playing with your brains a little bit, right? Brain research says very clearly that it can be painful when our fixed ideas are challenged. So if you have fixed ideas about Russia, about Vladimir Putin, about Russians, try to be aware when we are triggering that response. Hang on to it. We'll talk about it later when we open up for questions, OK? Um, here's the group that we traveled with. Um, Kudos to Bruce Gagnon for gathering a community of people, all of whom were um, quite excited to visit Russia. I think there's a little gadget here. You see that the group, the youngest people in the group, Manisha, she is from um, Beng yes. Nepal. I almost said Bangladesh. I'm a little nervous. She's from Nepal. And here is um, Bill Bliss's son, Lincoln. Those two were 24. They were the youngest in the group. Um, this gentleman, John Shushard, celebrated his 80th birthday um, on the trip to Russia. This is was, that's the gift that he gave himself. And there may be a few others that were um, in their 80s. Um, so this is, this, is the core this is the group that we um, traveled with in our, in our adventure. Um, many of the people in this group were Global Network members. Some are also veterans for peace. I want to give a big shout out to Will Griffin, he is uh, also one of the younger members of the group. He's both a member of the Veterans for Peace and Global Network. He has um, a website called The Peace Report. He's a veteran of both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so he's someone to keep an eye on if you are watching movers and shakers in the peace community. So I know that you're all wondering about food. Um, I want to get rid of all the necessities before we dive into what we were doing there. Um, let me just say up front, the food was really great. Some say the food is exceptional because Russia doesn't allow GMOs. Um, we ate a lot, and we never had a bad meal. Um, the guides for our, for our group, this gentleman on the left, his name is Leonid. He is um, an activist from Ukraine. He had to flee the country because of the conflict, um, the coup d'etat that happened there. He now lives outside of Moscow, and he's a member of the Coordination Council of the Union of Political Emigrants and Political Prisoners of Ukraine. He speaks 10 languages. He's now on the advisory board of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Um, he was a brilliant um, communicator and interpreter for us, not only in terms of language, but also um, in terms of culture and history. Tanya Bukharina, um, she, is, she supported us in Moscow and organized our tour through Crimea. Some of you here know her because she came to, um, to speak to us back in April. She's a true friend. Um, she's working on a pr project right now with Regis Trembley, and she'll be here for the month of July. So maybe we'll see a little more of Tanya. So I'm going to show you three maps. This first is a map of all of Russia. Um, and you can see that it's a huge, huge state. So, and you'll also see that we barely touched the surface, right? We, our trip took us to Moscow, to St. Petersburg, 
And then also down to, um, here we go, into uh, Crimea. This is Ukraine and this is Crimea. When we were in, we, st we started the trip in Moscow. Um, we spent five days there. Um, the trip was organized so that from nine to noon every day we had lectures and conversations, mostly with uh, some from our internally, but mostly with the Russian community. And then the afternoons, we were on our own to go tour around the city. We ended our tour in St. Petersburg. Um, we spent four days there. Uh, we had one day where we were all touring together, but the rest of it we um, explored on our own. Um, and we were able in St. Petersburg on May 9th to participate in their victory day, the victory over the Nazis. Um, and that was quite a special event. I'm sure my colleagues are going to tell you more about that day. But 1.2 million people were marching in the street holding images, holding photos of uh, family members who fought in that war some of whom died. So again, this is a picture of Ukraine. Uh, this is Ukraine here, and this is um, Crimea. And we visited, we flew into the city of Simferopol, Simferopol um, and then uh, drove down to Yalta and finally visited Sevastopol. So we visited those three amazing, amazing cities. So. Impressions. Before leaving for, um, for Russia, when I told folks, including some family members, um, I was surprised how often I was told to be careful, right? Um, I had people tell me things like, Vladimir Putin is evil, um, that he can't be trusted, that I can't believe what people tell me in Russia because they're afraid to speak, um, and People are, people are not free to speak the truth in that country. So it's um, stunning to me how much um, anxiety we have in this country about the unknown and how much the fear mongering of another country kind of permeates us cellularly. Um, I can tell you that I wasn't afraid to go to Russia and um, I was so, um, it was so confirming that the people in this country are kind of just like us. Pretty amazing, wonderful, open, eager to um, connect, and uh, just doing f ama wonderful things with their lives. So this, um, this young woman, her name is Irina. Um, she was practicing English by talking with us. We ran into her in a park. Um, and she happens to be the tandem bicycle champion in Russia. Um, the, when, when you compete in tandem bike riding, the person behind you is blind. So she does the, 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 um, the seeing, and the two of them together do the pushing, the pedaling, uh, and she's quite proud of how good she is at that particular skill. This young woman, um, her name is Mary. She, I met her in uh, Crimea. She was an interpreter. We had a press conference at one point, and so this lovely debate teacher brought in her high school students um, and had them come and practice their English by being interpreters for us and helping us navigate um, opportunities to talk with other people. So Mary um, is quite a debater and a lovely kid, and it was really fun to see her purple hair and her um, ambitions to be an international lawyer. Um, over here um, is a community of people. This woman, Valentina, is a friend of um, Tanya's. So a few of us visited the school that she runs. Um, she, um, the students that come to the school all have uh, cognitive disabilities, some with physical disabilities as well. Um, and she just provides a beautiful program for them. They were thrilled. They had never met Americans. So we were able to make a powerful connection. They sang and they danced for us. They wore traditional clothes. And uh, we had a beautiful, and of course, they gave us gifts. And so we had a beautiful connection. So um, I can tell you that there's so much to say about this experience, but uh, the connections with individuals was really, of course, the richest part of the experience. I also want to say that families are really important. Um, Tanya told us that during, after the fall of the Soviet Union, things were so hard in the country, there was just no food to eat. And so people stopped having kids. 
They went f for 10 years um, really containing the family life. Um, but that's not the situation anymore. And hopefully some of these photos give you an expression of um, the fact that kids are out playing and kids are out playing with their families and men my age are holding the hand of very old men and they're walking and engaging and being family together. Um, so that was a beautiful part of the experience for me as well. Um, the other clear fact is that Russia is a capitalist country. Um, among the many speakers that connected with us, there was a gentleman named Constantine, who was probably in his 40s, maybe a little older. Um, and he in particular spoke about how sad he is about his country's move away from the ideas of solidarity, collective work, shared resources, socialism. He's a socialist living in a capitalist country. And he had a very long lecture to give us about the dangers of capitalism and what capitalism has wrought in the world and how much suffering exists in the world because of a capitalist system. Um, so it was a powerful, powerful um, lecture that he gave us and it has left me with a lot of food for thought. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end now with this, with this story. Um, one of the other things you come away from Russia with is how deeply history is known and felt and experienced, um, and it has been through the millennia. Um, war has come to Russia's homeland throughout its history. Um, and Russian, Russians remember the lived ideals of its revolution and the devastation of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Russians told us over and over again that particularly the Russians for peace, they want nothing to do with war, but they are really clear and they understand the need to defend themselves. So this, this is a monument at the 35th battery um, in Crimea, in the city of Sebastopol. This is a way gave us a tour. We literally walked down into these bunkers that were built into a mountain. Um, this is the story, I get, here's the numbers. When the Nazis came to Crimea, they took the most of Crimea pretty quickly but in Sebastopol, um, it took eight to nine months. The people defended that city so powerfully and so strongly. Sebastopol, lo Sebastopol lost up to 300,000 people in this Nazi invasion, and Crimea lost as many as 600,000. So this was the most powerful museum I've ever been to in my life. Um, as they take us down into the bunker, we see where people um, slept or didn't sleep. We saw this pitiful small room where doctors perform surgery um, and we heard the anguish of the experience of having this brutal invasion in their country and the proud, the, pr the sense of pride that people held off um, for so, so many months um, to try and protect the people of their city. So when you what, what you do in this museum is you walk into this, this room where there's a wall of photos of people who lost their lives to that war. Um, and, and you're asked to spend some time in the quiet, to light a candle and spend some time in the quiet and meditate with them. And then you walk into a room and you see um, the names of many, many, many of the people who have died are just surrounding you on the walls. And then you walk into finally a third room where there's a rounded ceiling and you, you start by seeing the, the lights go down and you seeing the night stars. Um, and then one by one, each of those stars turns into the face of, of someone who lost their life. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing children and old people and soldiers and, and here you are kind of, quite frankly, overwhelmed. <laughs> and each image, each person <laughs> eventually turns into another star that is shooting through the skies. It is such a powerful anti-war um, expression and there are many anti-war expressions in this beautiful country and I'm, I'm grateful that I had a chance to go there and start, uh, start my relation a different relationship with Russia. Russia has tulips. We were there in the spring. Now it's Bill Bliss's turn.